Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. As a little Christmas gift to myself, I'm going to do another video on the Lauren the Mortician and Jeanette, aka Janet Braun, and their lawsuit with the Do We Know Them podcast, but specifically and especially with Caffeinated Kitty. And the reason why I say especially is that today we're going to cover the cease and desist letter that Jeanette Braun sent to Caffeinated Kitty. And I have some thoughts because I've never seen a cease and desist letter like this that came from an actual lawyer. I've seen letters like this, but this is the first time it came from somebody who was actually a lawyer. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But first, let's talk a little bit about what a cease and desist letter is and what makes a good one and what makes a bad one. A cease and desist letter is really just a letter. It says, hey, you're doing a thing stop it, knock it off, or else we'll sue, or else we'll take some other action, because maybe you've got other remedies available. But it's really just a stop it or else letter. It doesn't have any special legal power, um, unless it's like a court order, but that's a different thing. Um, really, sometimes a cease and desist letter might be something that puts you on legal notice, which can be relevant for certain reasons, but primarily it's just a letter. So why would you send a letter saying, hey, we might sue you? Well, really, it's because you don't want to sue people. Um, lawsuits may have some uncertainty. You might not be guaranteed a win. And in fact, your case might be a little weak. Um, you also might send a cease and desist letter because it's you'd rather that they just do the thing, especially because you may not actually be able to get the stop it remedy through the legal process. You might only be able to get money and you might prefer that they just stop it. So a good cease and desist letter should be sort of assertive without being aggressive. You want to be confident in your position. So you want to be clear that, you know, we think we're going to win and you want to lay that out for the other side in a way that makes the other side think that you're going to win if it goes to some sort of legal battle. And you also want to avoid things that are going to make the other side dig in their heels. And things that might do that are either um, you get the law wrong, or you're overly aggressive, or you're insulting, or that kind of thing. You know, if you're trying to pick a fight, then a cease and desist is really the wrong thing. You can just go ahead to the lawsuit and there's your fight. But if you want to pick a fight, this is the wrong approach. Um, Picking a fight gets you to the litigation that you were trying to avoid with the whole cease and desist. So I want to really briefly cover an example of a, a decent cease and desist. And this one I just found online. It is the state of Michigan's attorney general um, against a gas station. And it basically says, hey, um, so it starts off to whom it may concern. This letter gives you a notice of intended action. Basically, we're letting you know ahead of time we plan to do a thing and directs you to immediately cease and desist from engaging in the unlawful business of practices described below. And so they say, basically, as background, we're responsible for enforcing the law. We have probable cause to believe that your gas prices are too high. So that's basically what this paragraph is, is that um, your gas prices that you're charging are a buck fifty per gallon above your nearby competitors. And we think the reason why is because you are located near the metro airport. So all of the people who have rented a car who have to return that car back full, we think you're gouging them. And then they go on to say, hey, we did some investigation. Here's our evidence that says we're going to win. So we sent a special agent. They bought gas. It's in excess of the rates. Here's the picture of the rates. And we did that a few times. So... Based on that, we think we can charge you under the following laws. And, you know, basically they say here, uh, with many people traveling both uh, from and to our state in the coming days to spend the holidays with friends and family, we emphasize now that you should put the brakes on this pattern of what appears to be grossly excessive pricing. If you have additional information that might serve to justify your prices, we are very interested in receiving it. Know, however, that your mere location would not be a satisfactory justification even if that is, as one of the consumer complainants suggested, the explanation, i.e. Um, you might try to use this in your defense. It's not a defense. Don't bother. So then they go on to the actual or else part. And I think that this is actually fairly well written. I like the way that they did this in this one. So it says this office is taking steps to either file a civil lawsuit 
or commence a formal investigation. We're doing these things that now one of these is worse than the other. You don't want the lawsuit. You don't want the investigation, but you probably don't want the lawsuit more than you don't want the investigation. So they say your response to this notice is expected by January 8th, 2024, a deadline, and will help us determine which of these paths will be necessary. And then here's where it gets really clever. It says, we're also open to exploring an assurance of voluntary compliance with you as anticipated by the MCPA, i.e. we'd also be willing potentially to accept that you just promised that you will stop doing it. And so if you're the recipient of this letter and you're going, oh, oh, look at the laws I'm violating. Oh no, that thing about, oh, we might just take your word that you're not going to do it anymore. That looks really good. So this is a really good letter. It's short, it's simple, it's to the point. It doesn't pick a fight. It lays out why they think they're going to win. It does all of those things. And now we can compare and contrast with the letter that was sent to Caffeinated Kitty. And again, the uh, this is apparently the work of Jeanette Braun. Let's have a look. So, notice to cease and desist, Federal Rule of Evidence 408 communication. Uh, you might be wondering what that means. Federal Rule of Evidence 408 basically says that um, if you are offering to uh, resolve a claim by way of some sort of settlement, it can't be held against you to say that your claim is weak. That's what that means. So they sent it to Caffeinated Kitty and they also sent it to uh, her mom for some reason. Um, so RE, Lauren the Mortician, blackmail, extortion, defamation, false light, copyright infringement, harassment, and stalking. Ooh, okay, so there's there's a lot. Miss Redacted. Hope this email finds you well and in a centered and rational state of mind. I cannot think of a situation where I would ever write that in a cease and desist. Um, that kind of language has no business being a cease and desist. So when I saw this, my first thought was, what the heck? What am I reading? But it's going to continue. I am Lauren the Mortician's federal civil attorney and I'm in receipt of your email below. Now this part is useful. This is a good way to start out. I am, I'm this person's lawyer and here's why I'm writing you. Cool. The proper way to address me in communications is Ms. Braun. You and I are not on a, f uh, not a first name basis. So first of all, there's a proofreading problem, but second of all, um, who cares? This does not advance your client's interests in the slightest. As a lawyer, I don't care what the other side calls me so long as they are doing what my client needs. So, yeah, um, Jeanette, I can call you Jeanette because you're that's your name. Um, what are you doing? Attorney Braun would also suffice. Yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not really. You proclaim to be a demon playing a game of chess against me while I am playing checkers. I am not playing any games. None of this is a game, and it is clear you have no respect for the judicial process. However, you are not playing a game of chess. Your actions make it undeniable that you are playing a game of Twister in the mud. What? <laughs> what? Um... So this is in response to a caffeinated kitty video where she says, you know, I'm playing chess and you're playing checkers. When the other side is kind of making public jabs at you, the last thing you want to do in your cease and desist is let them know that you're getting to them. And that's what this does. Like this lets the other side know that you're mad. Don't do this. <laughs> Leave all of this out. And, you know, so you are a, proclaimed to be a demon playing a game of chess against me while I'm playing checkers. I'm not playing any games. None of this is a game, but it's Twister in the mud. Like this needed, even if you wanted to put this in and you didn't, like you didn't actually want to include this in a rational world. Um, this is just badly written at this point the viewer, like the reader is doing something you don't want them to do, which is they're laughing at you. That's not what a cease and desist is for. Um, if you want them to laugh at you, there's all sorts of better ways to do it. 
I recommend you stop playing all games and give the situation that you have caused the respect it deserves. Um, pot kettle. You also claim that you will, in so many words, do demon things in the very new, near future. You intended this to be a threat to others based on the connotation and context of the statement. Um, I'm just gonna say, like, you do know that this is a bit, right? You know that Caffeinated Kitty is doing, like, a persona, a bit. And you failing to get that in your cease and desist does not inspire confidence. Uh, also, a threat to do demon things. Unless you can put some substantiation to that or something, um, nobody cares. Like, nobody, nobody cares. So, yeah. You intended this to be a threat to others based on the connotation and context of the statement. Um, I can tell you, when I've been threatened, it's people saying, hey, I'm going to put a bullet in your skull. Um, that's a threat. You know, that's the kind of threat you take seriously. If I get a guy on the phone and he calls me up and says, I'm going to do demon things, I go, okay, buddy, click. Yeah. Okay. After seeing your multiple irrational and erratic posts on social media over the weekend, along with your TikTok live stream, I am worried that your mental state is unstable and that you may hurt yourself or someone else after reading this email. Um, why would you ever put this in a cease and desist letter? This makes no sense. Um, I'll explain why I think she's putting it in there, but uh, I believe you are not going to take the news well that you are wrong. If you have not composed yourself yet and are still spiraling, Please stop reading here and make sure you have someone from your support network that you trust to be with you while you read on. Heed this trigger warning. There is no circumstance in which you should be putting a trigger warning into a cease and desist letter. I cannot believe that I had to say this. And this to me looks less like actual cease and desist writing and more like CYA over the wellness checks this is a this is unhinged this is just nuts to put this in okay let's keep going because it, it, i was gonna say it can only go uphill you know like a bounce off rock bottom but i'm gonna prove myself wrong and it's gonna make us gonna make me sad so cease and desist you do not know everything that you think you know. Again, cut that line. Like, a cease and desist should be written to be professional. It should look like, I am a lawyer who has all of the cards, not, I am a child who is having a tantrum. And this comes off like a tantrum, as opposed to, like, when you have the aces, you don't sit there raging out. You don't, you just sit there with a, you know, calm, quiet smile, and you lay out why the other side is going to lose. And that's not what's going on here. If I was getting a letter like this from a lawyer, I'd be wondering what exactly is happening. Your conduct directly violates several laws and legal principles, many of which potentially have both criminal and civil activities. I strongly encourage you to hire attorneys, particularly a federal civil attorney and a federal criminal defense attorney. While this email is only intended to address your civil violations, I provide the potential criminal violations for your edification. Now, why would she say for your edification? Well, that to me seems like it's a bit of a kind of workaround to this issue. And this is from the Illinois Rules of Professional Conduct which notes that it's professional misconduct for a lawyer to, amongst other things, present, participate in presenting, or threaten to present criminal or professional disciplinary charges to obtain an advantage in a civil matter. Um, sorry, I can't scroll. Oh, there we go. So there we go. So um, what this means is that you cannot threaten somebody with criminal prosecution in order to get advantage on a civil file. That's not considered okay. So she says it's for the edification. I will let you, the viewer, decide if that's what this feels like or if uh, 
but yeah. In your email below, you admitted to copyright infringement and confirmed you are conspiring with Redacted Anon against my client. Um, spoiler alert, the email does not admit to copyright infringement. Um, and it also doesn't in admit to conspiring with anybody. It is in your best interest to hire an attorney before sending me any further communications. Um, hot kettle. You are hereby demanded to immediate cease your malicious activities. Um, again, when you're sending out a cease and desist letter, this is probably the most important document to proofread. You are trying to convince the other side that it is a bad idea to go up against you in court, which means you really don't want to look sloppy. This is the wrong time for a typo. So you are hereby demanded to immediate cease your malicious activities. Yeah, um, could have done better, which includes sending emails and posting on Reddit and other social media platforms, blackmail, harassing, extortion, defaming, false light, and copyright infringement claims against my client. Okay, um, let's see some, let's see the receipts because in, in a cease and desist, you want to show at least some receipts that you've got you know, that you've got them. We've got you pinned down on this. There are posts on various platforms with your username, Caffeinated Kitty. These actions are not only morally reprehensible, um, there is no reason to call someone out for moral reprehensibility in a cease and desist. You just want to tell them to stop. So, but also illegal. Tell us more. You may think that because you are a demon, as you have proclaimed, US laws do not apply to you. You are in fact human and U.S. laws along with international laws do apply to you. Did that feel like a good idea when you were writing it, Janet, Jeanette, whoever? Um, did that feel right as you were writing it? Because if so, you should have that aligned. There was no reason to include the because you are, a, you may think that because you are a demon. Um, Telling the other side that you just don't understand that they're doing a bit or whatever the heck this is. I don't know why you're putting this in. Um, it's a bad idea. Please note, this is not an attempt to restrict legitimate free speech. It is though. And we believe that the internet and social media platforms are important mediums for dissemination of accurate and truthful information for fair comments on issues of interest. For instance, if you wanted to make a video discussing your opinions or making true statements of fact, that would be within your rights. Um, that actually sounds like what you said they were doing in the lawsuit, where they said that they looked at a bunch of internet activity from your client and then formed an opinion about that. Okay, um, okay. So... Your activities, however, unlawfully violate my client's rights and are not protected by your First Amendment rights. Once again, I highly encourage you to hire an attorney as this is a serious matter. Bold text. Okay, so now they're going to get to the receipts, the meat of this. Blackmail, extortion, coercion. Sending threatening emails and posting social media posts under the username Caffeinated Kitty that demands something of value in exchange for not disclosing potentially damaging information is a clear violation of blackmail laws. Okay, they're saying, you know, she's saying that she's got some good ammo here. Under 18 USC section 873 and 876, blackmail is a criminal offense. Whoever, with intent to extort from any person any money or other thing of value, knowingly so deposits or causes to be delivered, as aforesaid, any communication with or without a name or designating mark, Subscribe thereto, address to any other person, and containing any threat to injure the property or reputation of the addressee or of another, or the reputation of a deceased person, or any threat to accuse the addressee or any other person of a crime, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than two years or both. Now, any other thing of value is pretty broad. There was a case where being with somebody in a relationship was considered an other thing of value. So that is fairly broad. All right. So now they're going to tell us what the blackmail is. And this is the place where you pull out your best card. You want to really show that you've absolutely got them dead to rights. Here goes. Here is one example of you blackmailing, extorting, coercing, 
extorting. So blackmailing slash extorting, missing a T, coercing with an S. Um, there isn't an S in coercing. So again, if you're a lawyer and you're suggesting that the other side is committing a crime, maybe spell the crime right. Um, my client from your email below. I do understand how you've reached out with cease and desist to smaller content creators speaking negatively about Lauren the Mortician scandals. And while I understand your desire to protect a creator you enjoy, if you were not legally obtained as counsel for her and I speak on this via my platform, your actions are going to cause her significantly more strife. I would imagine it would reflect very negatively on you and your practice as well for you to attempt to use your personal law firm to intimidate people because you don't like what they have to say. You should patch me in with your business development and PR team. I'm sure they have some interesting advice for you. Okay, we're going to talk about this. Um, this statement of yours is you attempting to extract a thing of value from me and slash or my client with a threat to injure her reputation. Um, this is not blackmail. This is not nearly blackmail. It's basically saying, hey, I don't know if you're actually this person's lawyer, but if you're not, you're you're making things so much worse. You're you're doing a stupid thing. And there isn't any if then. And certainly the you should patch me in with your business development and PR team isn't a thing of value that caffeinated kitty is trying to get in this communication. It's a thing, it's a way of emphasizing that you are doing a stupid thing. This is not remotely blackmail. It is not even close. It is not in the same family. It does not play the same sport. It does not go to the same school. It does not live in the same country or the same universe or what the, <clears throat> what the remedial law school exam is this. Um, yeah. You have made other statements in your videos posted on TikTok under the username Caffeinated Kitty. Civil remedies are available for blackmail, extortion, coercion. Uh, they got extortion right this time, but not mm, coercion. Yeah. In many states. I'm still just a little surprised. This this is the thing to spell right. Um, your spell checker should have found this one. Just saying. And if you didn't spell check it, well, that's just sloppy. So further in your email below, you confirm that you are working and conspiring with redacted anon against my client. Your actions may reach the level of organized crime. And again, I highly recommend you hire an attorney before contacting me again. Um, so first of all, they're going to later give us some like tight timelines as to when caffeinated kitty was supposed to have responded, but also organized crime. Are you kidding? Um, no, just, just no. Um, so much no. Um, harassment. Continuously sending harassing and abusive emails and slash or posts on social media platforms like Reddit and TikTok can constitute harassment. Spoiler alert, not in this case, but um, fair enough. <laughs> Which is illegal in many jurisdictions and is a crime at the federal level. Now, I'm just going to say the person who's calling in a wellness check on you because they don't like you, um, if they actually thought you were committing a crime, they'd have called the police to report the crime. And now we're going to get to more of the sloppy. And this is even worse. It says C18 USC section 2261. Okay, so what's a non-lawyer going to do the instant they get a reference to this? Well... They might Google it, which is why it's really important if you are quoting laws as saying that this is the uh, the thing that justifies your position, that you get those laws right. Because they cite 18 U.S.C. 2261, Interstate Domestic Violence, which states, A person who travels uh, in interstate or foreign commerce or enters or leaves Indian country or who is present within the special maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States with the intent to kill, injure, harass, or intimidate a spouse, intimate partner, or dating partner 
and who, in the course of or as a result of such travel or presence, commits or attempts to commit a crime of violence against that spouse, intimate partner, or dating partner, shall be punished as provided in subsection B. And there's the second one, which also covers spouses, intimate partners, or dating partners. Um, now, there's one of two possibilities here. Possibility number one is maybe Jeanette is confused and thinks that her client, Lauren the Mortician, is dating caffeinated Kitty, which is hilarious, but I don't think that's the likely outcome. Um, sorry, she's, she's not going to date you. It's not going to happen. Um, I think that what she meant to do was to cite the next section, which is 2261A. And you might say, okay, that's not such a big deal, except it is because when you look up the law that she's citing, she's got it wrong, which may get somebody to think, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me at all, or may get somebody to think, oh, this is a lawyer who is not careful with what they do and therefore maybe isn't the scariest person. Um, I'm much more worried about a lawyer who gets things right than one who gets things wrong. And this is the wrong section that was cited. Again, not what you want in a cease and desist letter. A person convicted of stalking under federal law faces up to five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. If the defendant's unlawful conduct results in the death of, of or physical injury to the victim, a conviction can land them in prison for 10 years, 20 years, or even up to life. Um, are you saying that Lauren the mortician was going to die from having a video made about her? Um, maybe you're calling the wellness check-in on the wrong person. Just, you know, like, why are you putting this in here? It's ridiculous. Civil remedies for harassment vary, and the laws can be found in every state. Well, um, given that this is a civil demand letter and that you're not threatening criminal prosecution... Um, maybe you should have included some of those. Wouldn't those have been relevant if this is a civil demand letter? As you have confirmed, you worked with Redacted Anon to send her email to my client, which would not constitute harassment. Sorry, um, no. Defamation constitutional rights violations. Now we're getting into some really funny things because constitutional rights violations. Um... It's actually really hard for an ordinary person to violate somebody's constitutional rights because you have constitutional rights as against the government, but not as against private citizens. So if a random person breaks into your house and steals all your guns because they don't believe that people should have guns, so they take all your guns and they throw them in the river, um... They have not violated your Second Amendment rights because they are not the government. If the government did that, then that would be a violation. So, um, Jeanette, do you think that Caffeinated Kitty is a government? Like, is, is she a country now? Um, is she an elected official? Is she, like, a police officer or somebody who's using governmental authority? Do you think the government is against your client? Um... Can I vote for Caffeinated Kitty? I don't know. Or do you just not know what you're doing here? Um, I don't know why you would put in constitutional rights violations. It has no place here. It is silly. So, you have posted false statements and allegations on public platforms about my client. And the statements are defamatory, damaging my client's reputation. Now, um, okay... The thing is, is that's not to defamation yet. Um, your statement that you caught my client interacting with extremist right-wing content and hateful anti-trans posts as well as, uh, as well in your TikTok video is a false statement of fact. Um, well, the statement of fact is interacting with the specific accounts and then the determination of those as extremist right-wing content and hateful anti-trans posts would be a matter of opinion, wouldn't it? Um, you are clear on fact versus opinion here, right? Because it's really important for this claim. I mean, I get that you're shading things to try to make it seem like you've got a claim here, but uh, yeah. 
You failed to identify one single sentence, element, or other identifier that supports your claims. None of the posts are hateful anti-trans posts. Again, like this sort of call out is pretty common on the internet. What you're doing here is smearing my client and violating her constitutional right to associate with whoever she pleases. Um, so she, again, is not a government. She isn't violating your right to associate with whoever she pleases. Um, she is, in fact, you are allowed to associate with whoever you please, but people might judge you based on that. You know, people can, can make comment on the fact that you are associating with people. Um, Mr. Rittenhouse was found not guilty by a jury of his peers. Um, this I don't understand because I couldn't actually find anything about Rittenhouse in all of this. And I'm not sure what this is about. So, um, yes, Mr. Rittenhouse was found not guilty by a jury of his peers, but, and I say this as a person who thinks that that was the correct verdict, you don't have to like Kyle Rittenhouse. You can hate him. Like, that's okay. You're entitled to that opinion. You're also entitled to, for instance, say that somebody's a crappy person if they like Kyle Rittenhouse. I think you're wrong, but, you know, it's an opinion you're allowed to have. I don't know where... So, with your rhetoric, it is clear you have no respect for the judicial process. Um, you're allowed to criticize judicial decisions. That That's okay. Like, that is, that is, in fact, constitutionally protected. Further, you have failed to state any true fact that shows my client supports Mr. Rittenhouse or Mr. Rittenhouse's specific actions. Again, specific is misspelled. Um, I didn't think that this was about Rittenhouse at all. I, I think that maybe she's got things confused. Because uh, you've also failed to state any true fact that conservative Ant is anti-LGBTQ. After all, he is gay himself and in a gay relationship. Well, then you shouldn't be upset about people saying that there's an affiliation. Like, if, if these things are, you know, if there isn't any issue with being connected to these people, then why are you upset by it? False light. Creating false narratives about my client through your emails intentionally places them in a false light. False light invasion of privacy can lead to legal consequences. You are creating the false narrative that my client is part of hate groups organized against the LGBTQ community, which could not be more wrong. Um, this again is one of those things I'd back up, but whatever. Further, you have not provided one fact that supports your claims below. Um, if you think that means they're going to quote the claims... It doesn't mean that. That's that's not going to happen. Civil laws and remedies are available in most every state. Um, this is when you would be really specific and say something like, including the state where we would sue you? That That's something I would have included. There's lots I wouldn't include in this, but I would definitely include that bit. Like, we did the research to get ready to sue you, so we know we can. Copyright infringement. By claiming fair use in your email below, you've admitted to infringing my client's copyright rights. That is not how that works. Um, if somebody says that something is fair use, they're not claiming that it's an infringement. They're in fact claiming that their activities are permitted by the law. Please refrain from providing me with refreshers of the law in your future communications. Um... Um, <laughs> as your refresher is incomplete, inadequate, and inaccurate. Um, um, it fails at every level and is a waste of my time to read. We're on page three of six, folks. Uh, as you've admitted on Reddit, you've seen my videos discussing fair use. My client never gave you permission to use her material. Um, that's not actually required for fair use. Uh, and your statement, I explicitly asked for her permission beforehand and still maintain it, is an outright lie. It wasn't that, that statement wasn't actually referring to you or your client. It was referring to the person whose content, like whose video they actually pulled stuff from, which happens to also have been including some of your video content. So, um, 
if you want to call somebody a liar in this, you should maybe check your facts, check your homework. As you've admitted in the TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook post under Caffeinated Kitty, that could be you attempting to blackmail me by smearing my name once you have your ducks in a row. Um, I don't believe that was actually admitted, and if it was, I would have quoted that other part, not the once I've got my ducks in a row. Um, your Facebook account was monetized. What? That, that clause doesn't actually connect to the rest of that sentence. I... Don't write mad. Like, or if you have to write when you're angry, come back when you're less angry and go over it, because I don't know what's going on. The law places the burden on you, misredacted, to prove fair use, not me. It actually does require you to conduct a fair use analysis as well, um, which you seem to acknowledge because you go on and say that, but um, you're talking about once when somebody sues over it. That said, um, commentary videos and criticism is a pretty well-established category of fair use and fair dealing. So, yeah. The law places the burden on you, misredacted, to prove fair use, not me. I performed a full fair use analysis, as is required by law, and my analysis is attorney-client privileged. Unless the court has ordered me to turn them over, they will remain in my files as a protected document. Um, this, this is your cease and desist letter. This is when you would lay out why it's not fair use. Um, this is weird. Like, I have evidence. I won't tell you what, what my argument is. It's your cease and desist letter. You're trying to scare this person. You need to show them why it's not fair use. Why? And you could just leave this out if you didn't want to provide it. Like, don't don't say I've got all this stuff that I'm not showing you. It just looks weak. If you want to engage in good faith settlement negotiations and are willing to comply with all demands below, I'm willing to ask my client if she would be willing to share those with you as part of a full settlement of the civil issue she has against you. She, of course, has the power to say no. Um, does anything about this feel like an, an approach to good faith settlement negotiations? Because if I read this, this is not something that screams, this is somebody I can have a good faith discussion with. This is something that says, oh my god, what the heck is going on on the other side of, of the table here? My client has suffered significant damage uh, to, as a result of you organizing a group of people to engage in the smear campaign. So, to what? Significant damage to to what? Um, you were going to tell us to, to what in there, and then somehow you forgot to put that in, because, again, um, proofread your demand, le your cease and desist letter. Like, yeah. As a result of you organizing a group of people to engage in the smear campaign, you continue to push and lead others to push, and is currently working to pursue all available legal remedies to protect her rights. Um, I highly doubt there was an organizing a group of people to engage in the smear campaign. I suspect it was just, I said some things and some people on the internet listen to me sometimes because they think I'm funny. Um, and... Having now seen a few caffeinated kitty videos, I can confirm she is funny. And, I mean, so are you, Jeanette. Um, don't sell yourself short. You're funny, too. Um, not the way you want to be, but you're funny. You're hereby demanded to cease and desist from any further communication with my client or posts on social media, including sending emails or any other forms of correspondence. Um, are you actually telling them that they have to like caffeinated kitty you can't post on any social media are you kidding you are demanded to issue a public apology to my client recanting all of the false information and overall false narrative you have posted and organized others to post um okay you're here i mean at least this is you know a demand but a cease and desist normally doesn't make demands you normally say this is a demand letter which is a little more aggressive but uh you're hereby demanded to remove every post you have made about my client on all social media platforms. 
You are also hereby demanded to remedy the damage you have caused my client, governed by civil rules by monetary compensation. Um, so this is now getting into what we'd call a demand letter of like, I want money for this. And one of the primary rules for a demand letter is you tell them how much money you want. Like if you're trying to say, we will make this go away for money, um, you, you tell them how much money so that they can actually take steps about that. If you have a general liability insurance policy or some similar policy, you must send them this letter within 24 hours of receiving it if the policy is to defend you in these actions. Um, that actually depends on the term of your contract with your insurance policy. That may or may not be how that policy goes. Um, I, she might be looking at her own insurance policy for that. I don't know. Failure to do so may result in the insurance policy refusing to insure your defense. You must also provide me with the name of your insurance carrier in the same time period. Again, I don't know if that's actually the case. Um, that's something I would talk to a lawyer about first. Further, because you believe only guilty people will try to hide from the real questions or something similar as you posted in a video on TikTok, here are a few questions for you to answer. Based on your logic, if you are not guilty of anything, you will answer misredacted. What? Is this a demand? Is this like, this is the kind of language I see in like an internet comment from someone with beef, um, not in legal writing. But what questions do they want? Who are the people in your team? Identify by full name, email, social media handles, and full physical address. Dox your team. That's not gonna go well, over well. Who are the smaller creators in your statement? I do understand how you've reached out with cease and desist to smaller content creators speaking. Identify by full name, email, social media handles, and full physical address. Um, how would she even have all of that? Like, I've spoken to lots of content creators, and I can tell you I don't have their full name, email, and full physical address unless for some reason I've needed to do some sort of deep investigation on them. Like... Does she think that Caffeinated Kitty has hired a PI for, these, for this or what? What platform did they contact you on? What date did they contact you on? Send me screenshots to support your answers. Is this like part of your demand or is this just like you're curious? What are all of your handles, usernames on TikTok, Reddit, Instagram, and Facebook? Why would you tell this to an opposing party? Like it makes no sense. Um, unless there's a settlement and now we're going to get into like some absolute, this has no business in here at all. Um, and like no anything. Why have you gone off brand with your smear campaign against my client? Um, Jeanette, why do you care about her brand? You proclaim to be a demon and a villain who traumatize, traumatizes men and you use the hashtag traumatize the men on the majority of your videos which again is her being funny. You may or may not like the joke, but it's her being funny. Why are you smearing my client who is a woman and without even trying or having an intention to do so, caused such trauma to a man, even without identifying him, that he went on a social media posting tirade, tirade spelled wrong, wrought with defamatory statements about my client and told the public himself that uh, he was the one my client was talking about. Um. Wait, do you, like, does Jeanette Braun think that Caffeinated Kitty's entire brand is about just hating men? Because I watched a few of her videos and I didn't get that feeling. Um, that does not seem to be her brand. Like, why are you going after my client who is a woman? Now, I just want to provide a little bit of backstory on this particular issue as to what the dispute is. So... Lauren the Mortician was apparently from, you know, and this is what I'm hearing. Uh, she was posting videos about car safety and with regards to child seats, like, you know. And so she did a video and some guy called her out and said, no, this is wrong. This is not correct. 
And so she went and called him creepy and implied it was really weird that he had all of these child safety seats in his car or in his house when he doesn't have any kids. Um, additional background information that's kind of relevant is that apparently his job is like safety for child seats. So why would a guy like that have a bunch of child car seats in his house? Oh, is it possibly for work? Like why would I have all of these legal texts on my shelf? Oh, right. It's because I do that for work. So why would she criticize you for that? Oh, right. Um, this makes no sense whatsoever. Is your entire online personality and brand a sham and facade? You claim to receive great joy from inflicting emotional distress on men. How much of a lie is this? Uh, again, yes, the entire personality is a bit, at least as far as I can, like, it's a bit. Do you understand the notion of a bit? Like if somebody playing up a character, do you not? Un this is like somebody who's just like, sitting in the movie theater being like, why is nobody stopping that man? He's shooting the other man. <laughs> you're saying you're an internet lawyer and you don't get any of it? No. Oh, this is hurting my brain. What is your connection with Jamie Grayson? Who cares? When did your friendship relationship with Mr. Grayson begin? Again, who cares? How does this affect your client in the slightest? Provide me with the name and link to the Discord server where you are collaborating with others to share the truth about LTM. Um, again, why? Explain what your bug slash worm parties are and why you throw them. Well, I can tell from my limited knowledge of Caffeinated Kitty that this is almost certainly another joke. And asking somebody to explain the joke is the height of not getting it, but... Explain someone how this could possibly be relevant or meaningful here. Why are you running down these insane corridors and sidelines. I don't get it at all. Okay. This letter is not intended to be an exhaustive statement of my client's civil rights, remedies, claims, or defenses, and she expressly reserved, no S, all rights and remedies available to them, um, she or them, pick, pick one, under the law. Any settlement of my client's civil claims against you does not settle her criminal claims against you. Those are to be handled through the appropriate authorities. You have 72 hours from the date of this uh, email to comply with the demands above, answer the questions asked, issue your public apology, and have seven days from the date of this email to contact me to remedy the damage by monetary compensation that you have caused. Um, lol is a complete sentence. My client expects immediate and unequivocal compliance. I have no idea why your client would expect that based on this letter. Um, and you're curious as to why somebody might be unsure about whether your client was actually represented by you. And I would be unsure too, because if I get an email like this, if this is like a cease and desist that I get, um, I start wondering if this is like serious. I start wondering what client would look over this and say, oh, hey, here's our draft cease and desist that I want to send and would read this and be like, oh, yes, that's excellent. Stamped, approved, send it. Because if I had a lawyer and they were looking like and they brought this to me as the draft cease and desist, I would in very short order have a new lawyer. Um, I would not put up with this level of work. This is, this is bad. Potential civil litigation hold notice. Spoliation of evidence mitigation. So this is a big boilerplate. I suspect that this is uh, copied and pasted, but basically says, please do not delete anything because we may sue you. And if you are deleting stuff, then that might be 
used against you. So I'm not going to go through all of that because it just says don't um, don't delete anything. So direct all future correspondence you want to send to my client to me. Okay, that's appropriate. Uh, yours very truly, Jeanette M. Braun, Esquire, attorney for Lauren the Mortician, CC'd the mother's name and the mother. Okay. Um, that's a hell of a thing. And I, I'm at a loss to understand why that was ever sent. Um, it just makes no sense. And it does refer to an email below. Um, I'm not going to show you the email because it, I don't have it redacted, but I'll read it out. It says, Good afternoon, Jeanette. I've reached out to the owner of the video you had taken down for copyright, and she confirmed that she did not have any issue with my reposting of her content, as I ex explicitly asked for her permission beforehand and still maintain it. Note that there is no way to interpret that sentence as referring to reaching out to Lauren the Mortician. There just isn't any way any reasonable person would infer that. My team and I would love further details on your client and how the video had grounds for a copyright strike, as it clearly falls under fair use. And it says, under the fair use of the U.S. copyright statute, it is permissible to use limited portions of work, including quotes, for purposes such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, and scholarly reports. There are no legal rules permitting the use of a specific number of words, a, spe a certain number of musical notes, or a percentage of work. Whether a particular use qualifies as fair use depends on all the circumstances. And they cite a uh, an example, or Caffeinated Kitty cites an example, if you needed a refresher. A little saucy, but to be expected. I do understand how you've reached out with cease and desist to smaller content creators speaking negatively about Lauren the Mortician scandals, and while I understand your desire to protect a creator you enjoy, if you were not legally obtained as counsel for her and I speak on this via my platform, your actions are going to cause her significantly more strife. I would imagine it would reflect very negatively on you and your practice as well uh, for you to attempt to use your personal law firm to intimidate people because you don't like what they have to say. And again, this is... If you're not her lawyer, then what you're doing is crazy and will hurt her and yourself. That is a reasonable statement. Um, you should patch me in with your business development and PR team. I'm sure they'd have some interesting advice for you. Like just 20 minutes of straight screaming. I look forward to your response, Kitty. Okay, so... Um, yeah... That is, that's something. Um, again, I don't know what, like, how does this end up being six pages? Why are they, um, you should never be sending a six page cease and desist unless you're relying primarily on like, here is lots of detail about the, um, you know, about how we know you did it. That's what can really pad it out. But there isn't a need to be that wordy. There isn't a need to, um, to go into that. This is so bad. This is so, so bad. If I hired a student and they produced this as a thing, I would not be sending this out. I'd be sitting them down and saying, okay, um, you're new here. Let's have a talk. Let's go over this and let's talk about what this should and should not look like. We'll... We'll correct this. We'll fix it. If I hired somebody who had, you know, five, six years of experience and should know better, I would start checking their references again because I don't know. This makes no sense to me at all. Um, what are bugs slash worm parties? How does that possibly advance the interests of your client? In what universe was that a good idea to put to paper? Um, in what universe was it a good idea to say like, hey, I'm worried about your mental health. Why are you putting that in a cease and desist letter where you want someone to stop doing a thing? So anyway, um, this is awful. And I expect it's going to continue to be awful. Um, I'm looking forward to how this lawsuit develops because it certainly started off with sort of a squelchy wet sound. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to reach out and see if there's more of these cease and desist letters out there because this one is a banger. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. This, as I mentioned, was a little bit of a present to myself. Um, I say a little bit. I know that this is going to be like an hour long video, but thank you for making it this far. If you have, I figure you probably owe me hitting the subscribe button because you watched an hour long video. Clearly you like it here. Um, or you're Jeanette Braun and you're hate watching. That's also fair. In which case you should subscribe to hate watch future videos because there will be more. Uh, please like the video, and if you feel inclined to contribute, there's also a Patreon link below, or you can send uh, super thanks, super, uh, you know, whatever they call the super messages. All of that are options if you want to support the channel. I do want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Lembus for the Elf, the CCFR, Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $20 level, Lindsay Metcalf, Larry Kalniak, Kyle Fox, Drunk All of the Baileys, I love that, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, Vicky, and Dorky Dane. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the call immediately following. Thank you for watching. Hope this is armed you with knowledge. Hope it's made you laugh a little. See you next time.